first reading is from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 through 6. Arise, shine for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and a thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on your hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land. Young camels of Midian and Ephra and all of Seba will come, bringing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, from chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my sermon title is, Yes, Baby Jesus Cried. The Gospels never say no crying he makes. That's a great Christmas song, you know, that everybody loves. And we have this picture of baby Jesus that's just a perfect little adorable baby. It just smiles and coos. But what the Bible does say in the Gospel of John, when Jesus' best friend Lazarus dies, it says Jesus wept. So we know in the Bibles it does say that Jesus cried. But in this passage, when we read the wise men coming, they see a star. They see, they come to see King Herod. They come to give their gifts to baby Jesus. There's a lot going on in this passage. And Matthew has a unique birth narrative. Now, of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how many of them have Jesus being crucified? All four of them. That's kind of the main thing that they talk about. How many of them had John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in the Jordan River? All four of them. There are certain things that Jesus that happened in Jesus' life that are marked, that the story of Jesus <clears throat> excuse me, is about his ministry, about starting with John the Baptist. He does miracles, he teaches, he heals, he does these miraculous things, and ultimately he is condemned and crucified on a cross. Now, not much we think happened in Jesus' early life. The reason people say that we don't think much happened in his early life is because if he had been doing miracles his whole life long, people would have noticed and probably have written it down. But the four Gospels, they only start in his adult life. Now, Matthew, when he put together the story of Jesus' life, has this story of the wise men at the beginning. Now, you might think to yourself, what is going on with the Magi? And why are there no shepherds? Why are there no angels in the fields? Why is there no census with Joseph and Mary having to travel? It's like, oh, that's Luke, the Gospel of Luke's story, which happens to be completely different from Matthew's story. 
So believe it or not, there are actually good Christian scholars that don't necessarily think the Matthew's birth narrative is entirely literal. They think that, you know, there may have been some gift giving, there may have been foreign dignitaries that came. It certainly fulfills the Old Testament prophecy that we read in Isaiah about people coming from foreign lands to bringing gold and frankincense. But if we look at the story a little bit more, perhaps Matthew isn't trying to tell us literally what happened when Jesus was born. Maybe he's trying to tell us something a bit more important. So let's look at the three main parts of this story. It's a good Christmas story. You've got the star, you've got the three wise men, and you've got the three gifts. Now pretty much every Christmas card that you'll ever see you know, has you know, the star, the magi, or you know, them presenting their gifts with camels and such. But each one of these things is kind of a unique element. So we're going to kind of touch through some of them here. The first one we'll start with is the star. Have any of you ever read an article or tried to figure out what the star really was? I was reading an article the other day that popped up and said it was actually the planet Jupiter and Venus were together in the sign of Leo, but that only happened at like 7 BC, whereas this you know, other people think it was a supernova that went off and you could only see it from a certain part of the globe, which is why the wise men saw it, but that was in like 4 AD. People have tried to bend over backwards to kind of explain the star, where it came from, what it meant, you know, and actually try and pace out like what the night sky would have looked like. And, and there are some compelling reasons to say that it was this constellation of things happening. Astrologers gave a lot of importance to how the planets moved in the sky. They dictated moods. They were given the names of the gods. So you had Jupiter, who was actually the Zeus, the chief god, god of power. You know, and you had Venus, the goddess of love. And when you had those two planets together, you know, power and love, that was a great sign. Or if it was in the sign of Leo, the lion, Judah was called the sign was called the country, the nation of Judah. So perhaps these wise men, knowing of Judah's association with the lion, seeing this symbol of divine love and power, hey, there's a new king of love. Let's go see who it is. Now, whether or not you're an astrophysicist or an ancient astrologist and you know all of these different things, it doesn't really change the fact that in the Scripture story, the heavens themselves declare something is happening, something unique to right here and now. The star might not be a literal supernova or two planets coming together to make a super bright light, but in Matthew's gospel, the star is a symbol for the readers to read and to see something unique is happening. Something beyond just the mundane day-to-day -day stuff that we see. Something that even the heavens themselves declare. So when we go out and we look at the starry night and we look at all of those billions of stars to think that God knows them all and put them there and can use those stars to tell a divine story for our sake. So there's the star. And then we have the magi. Now did you read in the story when I said that the three magi came? Or did you read in the story, did you hear when I said the twelve magi came? Well, now you're thinking to yourself, oh no, are there 12? Did I miss something? Are there really three? Did I miss something too? The Gospels don't, doesn't actually say how many there were. It just says, they. They came. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, there's an understanding that there were 12 magi that came. Symbolic of mirroring the 12 disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel. The Western church typically think there are three because they do list three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And we figure, oh, well, obviously, if there are three presents, there must be three people because you can only carry one present, right? Right? I'm sure you all, when you were buying Christmas presents, you just bought your one present for your, your significant other or your child, right? Here's the one present. And the Magi, they don't say where they were from. It just says they were from a land beyond the east, so typically, people have sort of assumed they're from Persia. So this is like present day like Iran, maybe even as far as India. And they must have traveled for weeks and weeks to get to where Jesus is, is was. So you have to think that this star that appeared 
for these people to follow it, for them to know the heavens, to see what was always going on and to recognize something is going on here. We have to come and see. Now, whether you think that there were three or 12 or maybe there was the 13th one in the back that they kind of forgot to count who was kind of bringing up the rear. When the wise men show up, when the magi show up, it's a symbolic fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies that the nations, the Gentiles, people outside of Israel will recognize that something special is happening. Something big is happening. You see, it's one thing for a royal family, to have a royal child. I'm sure none of you followed the, the story of the British royalty when, you know, they were having all of their kids and they got their, you know, George and what's, I don't, I actually don't follow it, I confess. But, but I know it's in all the, the People magazines and the, the tabloids and everything about the royal families and the to-dos and who's pregnant and then, oh my goodness, and then their kids are born and the whole country is following along. So it would make sense when the Magi come and they say there's this royal child born that they would go to Jerusalem to see Herod, the king. Hey, king, where's your new baby? Who's the heir apparent? And Herod kind of looks around. You having a baby? No? You having a baby? No? I ain't having a baby. Hmm... Well, he says to the Magi, since you know so much about this baby, we'll figure out where it's supposed to be born. You go find it and come and tell me where the baby is, and then I'll come and worship too. Wink, wink. We'll get into Herod's story a little bit next week. So the Magi, they're, they're waiting for this king, and the, the scribes and come back. They've been looking over the Old Testament. They say, oh, in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, that's where it's going to be passage from Micah in the Old Testament prophet. So the wise man was like, all right, well, we're off to Bethlehem. And it says, as they're going, they saw the star up here and they followed it until it rested over the place where Jesus was. Now, I don't know what kind of star can go and then you stop over a specific dwelling or a specific house, but that's pretty impressive. Because even Benny at three years old can recognize that when you're looking at the moon over the house, when you walk to the side of the house, to the neighbor's house, then the moon's over the neighbor's house. And as you're driving along in the car, the moon goes over all the houses. So for that star to stop over one particular house is kind of a miraculous feat indeed. And for these three or twelve or however many magi to recognize it, that this is the place where we must stop, is again miraculous, even more so. But they come in as guests. They come in to serve. They come bearing gifts. They don't come to do treaty agreements. They don't come to do um, uh, battle arrangements or anything like that. They come to bring gifts. We've come to honor and worship the one who has been born. So they bring their gold, their frankincense, their myrrh, and they lay it down at Mary and Joseph's feet. And he was a humble carpenter. He's not a rich man. He's not a tradesperson. He's not an aristocrat or a noble. So he's probably wearing plain clothes, doing his work, you know, covered in sawdust or whatever he is. I was blessed enough to get a, a used table saw and I was working on some projects and my, it doesn't have a ventilation or an air hose vacuum hooked up to it. So when you cut something on the saw hose, that sawdust is like poof, it just covers everything. So I imagine Joseph with his woodworking shop, with his rough hands, working away, the baby sleep, and these three nobles show up from a foreign country wearing fine clothes with silks and spices and gold. And they offer him to Jesus. Like, Here, this is for you. This is for him. What that must be like. I was touched when the neighbors brought over a little bag of treats and they're like, here, you know, I'm like, thank you. But the Magi were special. And Matthew knew that in order for Jesus to be who he was as an adult, it had to have been recognized when he was a child. So these Magi come as a symbol of the nations from these foreign countries coming to Jesus to give their gifts, to pay homage 
and allegiance to the one true king. And the last thing we'll talk about today are the three gifts themselves. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, we all have seen gold, and we know where gold comes from. But frankincense and myrrh both come from trees, exotic trees out in the East, in the Middle East and in India. And frankincense, you know, they're kind of oily, sappy stuff. And in, frankincense is where we actually get the name incense. Like, you would actually burn it. You'd set it on fire with some coals in a little canister, and it would put off this very pungent and a very nice smell. And they would use this as divine worship. As the smoke would go up. And the thought was that as you burned incense, as the smoke would go up and be received by God, it was like your prayers being lifted up to God and that he would hear your prayers and he would smell the incense and it would be pleasing to God. So for these wise men, for these magi to bring incense to Jesus and say, here, this belongs to you. This is who you are. It's perhaps a symbol of them saying, we recognize that you're not just a political king. Political kings need money. They need gold to raise armies, to buy armor, to buy food, to build roads, to keep the economy going. Like That's what kings and rulers do with their money. But frankincense, that's for the temple. That's for worship. That's for the gods. And here they are, giving it to Jesus. So this gift isn't just another something nice that old people in the Old Testament really liked. This is a profound statement of who Jesus is in his divinity. When Jesus came and said, I and the Father are one, or that when I lay my life down, I can take it back up again, or when Jesus says, I can forgive sins, When Jesus dies and comes back to life and says, come and follow me and I will welcome you into my Father's kingdom. When Jesus does those things, he is doing them as God. Jesus is God. And this gift of frankincense is a symbol of that goodness. So gold, riches, tribute, economy, currency. The gold that they bring. Everyone loves getting gold. The little gelt coins, you know, that people get. You know, Benny knows, you know, that those open up to be chocolate. So he's like, chocolate, chocolate. You know, and he'll want it. He'll sit there and peel it open. Gold is something that's valuable in and of itself. It doesn't really symbolize anything else. Whoever has the gold makes the rules, you know, sort of a thing. Gold itself is power. So to have gold means to have power. You can stay at a hotel. You can buy new clothes. You can buy a new house. You can hire servants to carry all your stuff with you. If you've got enough gold, you can buy a nation. You can buy fields. You can do whatever you want with it. And no doubt, Jesus' early life, they put that gold to good use. Buying medicine, food. I doubt they lived an extravagant lifestyle and I doubt the gold they bought was enough to buy a mansion because it doesn't talk much about Jesus and his mansion. But gold is a gift for a king. So when the Magi came, they knew they can't just bring some frankincense, you know. They had to bring some real gold. So here's the frankincense that I talked about already. And this is a gift for a god. And then lastly... We come to myrrh, with two R's, myrrh. It also comes from the sap of a tree. It's not quite as fragrant with sort of a a floral, pleasant smelling as as the the frankincense. Myrrh has a little bit more of of a bitter, earthy smell to it. But it's got medicinal properties. So it would be used for, for, uh, for medicines and for burial rites, and they would use it in mix it with aloes to, to rub on, on skins and stuff like that. And myrrh was often used in burial rites. So it was a very pungent smell, so people would actually use it to keep people from smelling too bad, you know, as they were doing the funeral stuff. And they would wrap it around people's bodies, and they would wrap the cloth around it. It even says when Jesus was buried, Nicodemus brought 
a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes to wrap around the body for his burial. So now we have this third gift of myrrh. So now imagine your baby Jesus. You got your mom and your dad sitting there, the carpenter and family, and they bring you gold. Hey, we can use gold. They bring you some incense. All right, hey, well, this is, this is nice. We can offer up prayers to God. And then they bring you some myrrh. Here. This is often used for dead people, but would you like some? You know, it, it, it's kinda, it has some medicinal uses too. You know, you could do that. You're like, okay. Thank you. Yay, myrrh. Look, honey. From the nice magi next door. Maybe we could re-gift it next Christmas. We'll just... Again, maybe this isn't a literal gift. I wasn't there when Jesus was visited by the Magi. I don't know if they brought this or if they brought other things. Maybe they brought him, you know, some goat's milk or some goat cheese, some nice linens, you know, to, to wrap him up in, you know, a little toddler suit. But Matthew writes that they brought myrrh. And perhaps this is something that you would say is a gift for a corpse. Perhaps this is something that you would give to a sick person. Someone who was ailing. Someone who needed help. Someone whose physical body was giving way. Perhaps Matthew isn't saying that the baby Jesus was sickly. Perhaps he was saying that Jesus was going to need it. And this is a symbol of who Jesus is and what he was going to do. You see the gifts that Jesus received. They're not just nice presents that you might be given. I'm sure if you had to go through all the gifts you got for Christmas, you might be able to remember 80% 80% of them off the top of your head, then they'll be like, oh, there was something else. What did, what did Aunt so-and-so get? Or what did we get from my brother? And then year to year, the gifts kind of fade even more. But there might be one or two gifts that are memorable. There might be one or two stories that you remember. Me and my brothers, when we were growing up, we would always get gifts from our relatives in Minnesota, and they would always get us... Uh, Colts gear, like the, the football team. So we'd get like baseball, ca- or baseball caps with the logo on it or a sweatshirt with the logo on it because they were big football fans. Um, or from Indianapolis, sorry, got fan. And, um, but we had, all, we had, you know, and that was always kind of a thing. And that kind of became a running joke for a couple years. And then I think at one point we told us like, we don't need any more, you know, football paraphernalia. I think we're, I think we're set for a while. But then, of course, last year being our first Christmas in St. Louis, we got everybody St. Louis gear. So it's like, here's stuff with the arch and with Cardinals stuff on it, and we sent that all out to everybody. And this year we were thinking about, what do we want to get them? It's like, oh, we can get them like Cardinals t-shirts. And Cardinals. It's like, well, we did that last year. So let's not be like our other relatives. But perhaps maybe, maybe later in life, Mary and Joseph were recollecting. It's like, remember those gifts of all the Christmases that we got? Remember the, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh? Yeah, that was weird. That was a weird first Christmas. But hey, maybe maybe it's going to mean something someday. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, it made sense. Maybe this really is who Jesus is. So maybe, just maybe, Matthew's story is not literal. Maybe there weren't literally three. Maybe there weren't three literal gifts. Maybe there wasn't a literal star in the heaven. But maybe... Matthew was telling us something more important. Maybe Matthew was telling us who Jesus is. Maybe Matthew was trying to make a point that the Jesus who was baptized by John the Baptist, which did happen, maybe this Jesus who was crucified, which did happen, and maybe this Jesus who was resurrected, that did happen and was attest to it, maybe this is a way of introducing that Jesus, of giving him a birth story worthy of remembrance. Something that the people will look back and say, from day one, the world knew who Jesus was. Maybe these gifts 
will be remembered throughout history as symbols, as images, to remind people again, year after year after year, about who Jesus is and what he came to do. Yes, baby, Jesus cried. He cried for you and me in our sin. He cried for the innocent who died. He cried for the corruption of the nations. He cried for the pain of the world. But he also cried tears of joys for the peace that he would bring us. He cried for the justice that would come. He cried for the healing of the nations. And he cried because love would be victorious. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for baby Jesus, for the life that he lived, Lord, for the gifts that he received, for Matthew's story of it, and for us here today as we recount the gospel story. Lord, it is history for us. It is truth. It may not be literal, Lord, but if it is, we give you thanks. It is important, Lord, It is truthful because it shows us who your son Jesus is and it is in his name we have this season, this holiday. In fact, it is in his name we have forgiveness and our life. So Lord, we give you thanks for Jesus, for the magi, for the gifts and the star. We give you gifts, we give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen.